Hey, what's up, Reefers? I'm super happy because it's proud daddy time. Nina is finally 15 months old and we finally sent her to daycare. So with both her and Leon at daycare, during the day now, I have a little bit more time to myself as well as to the wife. Yes, good time is finally here. Oh my goodness. So this is what retirement feels like. Right now, just going to work, it's a blessing compared to having to work and then having Nina behind me. With that said, I owe you guys a lot of updates on the 145 gallon tank as well as the mangrove tank because a lot has changed for both tanks and have not talked about it at all. But today, let's focus on the 135. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you have seen bits and pieces of this tank throughout the year. But well, let's do kind of like a um, a quick tank walkthrough. This is one of those kind of videos that I used to do. It's um, kind of pretty much one take, and I give you all the details of this different kind of corals that's going on, anything special going on with this tank. Uh, we're not gonna focus too much on equipment in this particular video. I'm just gonna touch on what my dosing regimen is near the end of the video. But today, let's go ahead and talk about the animals first, which is my main focus. Oh, by the way, look at those. Those, see those clamps? We'll talk about that a little bit later in this video too. But first, let's talk about the SPS. A quick refresher, this tank went through a crash last February, so almost a year ago before I went to Japan. And the cost, I believe, was me swapping out the uh, the, the strip lights. They, they, these used to be the AliExpress light. They were super nice, super budget. Uh, when I had swapped these out for AI Blaze to try out as they offered me, uh, I did not realize how much spread these light have and even though the par number is somewhat similar but the corals are just getting different types of light and more coverage so as a result it stressed some of the corals out i believe it was my original golden rod colony that pretty much just folded on itself it collapsed it died and i believe it led to a bacterial infection that took down pretty much almost all of the sps the only thing that survived was uh this torch right here this slime ball right here died back as well. And also have a tiny chunks of golden rod that used to be here. As you can see now, it was large enough for me to pull a big frag out and plant it there. And it started growing there as well. So I lost a lot of corals at the time. Uh, some nice surprises includes the golf bonsai. It was completely bleach white. Uh, so I pulled the whole thing out. And after two or three months, I saw some things started encrusting. And sure enough, there was a little bit of a goth bonsai remaining in the rock. And as you can see today, it started pulling out and then it started shooting out, uh, sending out shoots. So that's a really nice surprise. And the other corals that survived, uh, it's doing really well, as you can see, the slime ball. I did not pluck off the dyed off branch, so there was like bare bleach tips, uh, sometimes even like an inch or two. I just kind of left it and see what's going on. And eventually they got covered and, and now you can't even tell that they were dead branch. They just grew, got grown over. As the slime ball get to a certain size, you start seeing the formation. Initially, when the, uh, this Anacopora was small, I'm not a huge fan of it, but as it started growing, it retained a nice neon green color. It's like a nice fluorescent green. And also, I really like the formation because formation, it starts fanning out and it's shooting up. I like the fact that it's not so dense that it's covering the lower branch, at least not yet. That is one of the big concerns for SPS coral. So we'll see how it goes. Now to the side is one of my favorite SPS, the Golden Rods Anacopora. And uh, like I mentioned, it died back to a small, small section. I kept it there. It kind of exploded in growth. Once the condition is proper again, I took one chunk, slap it on the rock, and just start growing. One thing about these Anacopora, so it's not just with the golden rod, but it's also with the slime ball, also with the TNT, is that they don't really encrust onto the rock that much. They kind of just sprout out from there. Uh, so as a result, you see them growing so much faster compared to Acopora, because a lot of the Acopora, at least the ones I have, they encrust to have a strong base first. It takes a while. They pull out, similar to the goth. They pull out, and then they go up and all of the branches are really tough. I need a bone cutter to really snip it off. Versus Anacopora, they grow really fast. They don't really encrust. So every time I touch it, I'm afraid I'm gonna knock the whole thing out and they break so easily. Like I touch it, I sneeze at it, I got a frag. So there's kind of, I started noticing a difference between the Anacopora and Acopora. If you ask me which one I prefer, personally, I really like the Anacopora simply because I like to see the results. 
much faster. Versus like Kapora, you pretty much just sit there and just wait for at least half a year, at least in my case, for it to encrust and then it starts sprouting. Since we're talking about SPS, we got to talk about the corals that Box Reef, a local reefer, hooked me up after the tank, tank crash. So he hooked me up with this. Bill Murray is a really nice size chunk. Uh, it browned out a little bit in my tank as expected, but it has been almost half a year at this point, and you'll see that it started coloring up. Some of the hot pink started coming at the tip, and the growth tip has like a neon teal to it. So I'm really looking forward to what it color up to be. The other SPS that Box Reef hooked me up with is the Firecracker. This is probably one of my favorite coral in this tank along with the uh, Goldenrod simply because of, like the name implied, Firecracker kind of coloration. Look at the hot pink, hot fuchsia with like bright neon green pile. I absolutely love that coral. It seems to be taking off now, so it's growing much faster because for half a year, it's also not doing too much. Oh, look at this, feeding time for the fish. You know what? Let me jump away from SPS and talk about the fish real quick and then we'll jump back to SPS to finish it and then LPS and softies and then inverts like the clamps. Now the, the reason they all kind of line up there is because uh, I have the auto feeder from Avas on. It goes off of like three times a day and each time for about minutes and it'll just drop uh, freeze dry mices and also cyclops and also some flakes. So you see all the fish, everybody gets something. All the fish has been doing excellence. The Lattel Envious uh, becoming the boss of the tank. They simply dominate. I have six of them. I feel like it may be too many for this tank at this moment because they used to be maybe like half the size. They used to be a lot smaller and they have all grown, especially the male. But they're absolutely beautiful. I think like my dream stock for this tank would be a combination of Amphius and Green Chromis. Now the issue is that the Green Chromis do get big, but my thought is that if they get big, I can simply rehome them or trade them in the fish store for smaller ones. Now the major hesitation with the Green Chromis, number one is of course the bio load of this tank, something will have to give. I may need to rehome one, uh, one or two layer tail and also the uh, Hippo tank, which is another topic that I'll get into shortly. And also Green Chromis does have the tendency to carry some pretty vicious disease like the Euromia. Man, I can't even pronounce it. I have it down here. But some people claim that almost 100% of the green chromis will have those and you have to quarantine, which I do not have a quarantine set up. Maybe now that I have a little time, I may set one up. I do not know. But my dream stock list for this tank is gonna be Lattel Amphius as well as green chromis. They are more beginner, it's tough to call them beginner fish, but more common fish. But I do feel that they give that coral reef vibe that I'm really going after in this tank. Now, if I do happen to free up the bio load and I decided not to go for the green chromis, I am thinking maybe a few damsels, more peaceful ones, like the um, uh, Springer's damsels or the Starkey's damsels, maybe two or three of those will be nice to add some activities and also smaller fish size to uh, keep the scale. Because as you get larger fish, the tank looks smaller. I mean, that, that's kind of common sense. So I kind of like smaller fish. Back to the hippo tank. The reason why I'm starting to think about uh, rehoming the hippo tank is because number one, I mean, th this tank is still okay. Although four foot tank is still not 100% ideal for a hippo tank, especially when they get a little bit larger, they do get much larger. So at some point I will rehome him, but the major concern is that hippo tank once it get to a certain size, they may start sampling corals. Not all of them do, but quite a few of them do turn on corals once you get to a certain size. So I feel like, okay, it's a matter of time. And if I'm already thinking about mixing up the stock list, maybe it's time to make a move. We don't know. Along with the other fish, um, here's the Hawaiian yellow tang. This is one of the last yellow tang to make it out before the Hawaii, Hawaii ban. But I think the ban should be lifting soon from what I'm hearing. So uh, I think more of these may be coming in. However, I think Bi Biotis is making good progress with the um, captive bred yellow tang and it has been uh, proven that the captive bred one can also take on the more vibrant yellow as the wild caught counterpart. So at this point, I feel like captive bred is probably the way to go, especially since they are already adjusted to aquarium life. Coming here to say hi is also a Aptasia eating foul fish. I have a love-hate relationship with this kind of fish. Uh, so you know, this is my third one. Uh, the first sec, first sec, actually no, this is the fourth one. The first one I got, it was still called the Bristol, uh, Bristol Tail Foul Fish. Uh, later on, they did a good job marketing it, calling it the Aptasia eating foul fish because yes, they do eat the uh, 
they do eat Aptasia. However, the issue with them is that once they start eating Aptasia, once they finished it, in my experience at least, they start going after meaty corals. It's like they got a taste for anemone in this case. Uh, they start sampling out of things. Now there have been people telling me that the Aptasia eating foul fish has been a model citizen, which is great. I hope that this one turned out that way. But for me, they always end up going after corals afterwards. So I'm holding my breath. But each time after I rehome the uh, Bristol tail or the Aptasia eating foul fish, Aptasia always pop back out after like three or four months. So it's like a never ending cycle. So this time I'll try to be smarter. I will rehome this guy into the refugium. It'll have a really nice life down there and kind of just like cycle, cycle the foul fish in, uh, here and down there, here and down there as needed. And we'll see how it goes. Uh, look at this guy. Right now he is still picking at all the things, but not quite at Aptasia yet. I'm leaving those there for him to, uh, as a test. And as the, so I know that I start sampling Aptasias. I am so sorry. That was a huge tangent on fish. Let's get back up to SPS, shall we? And by the way, the sound you're hearing is my Alcatronic going off. Alcatronic is still running. I think it's like the fourth year now. No issue at all. Love that piece of equipment. But again, not about equipment in this video. SPS. Let's also talk about the... Uh, Freck Roa contest from Top Shelf Aquatics. My strategy has always been just place them there and just not touch them. And true to my words, I have not touched these guys since June. They have just been sitting there. And let me see if I can zoom in for a closer look. You see that instead of growing upwards, a lot of these guys started pulling out and they started touching too, which is a big no-no. A lot of people are saying that, okay, I went to Coral's touch, SPS touch, it's likely that they'll fight, and when they fight, the growth kind of gets stunned a little bit. Um, uh, Thirsty's Reef recommended, what one thing I could do is kind of like move this guy up, cut off the stem, mount it onto another frag plug, and plant it that way. And that will stop them from growing down, instead they'll start growing upwards. I trust him, because Johnny handles a lot of high-end SPS. However, I, I'm sticking to my gun uh, in terms of not touching these frags for the duration of the contest, which should be ending in December. So it's like two more months. I figure, okay, after two months, I'm gonna mount them that way. I'm gonna plant them into the final destination. So I'm just gonna stick it out and see how they do. But so far, I think the best grower is this one, Orange Sickle, and also the um, Raspberry Splice. The other stuff, like the um, Pebble Spice, I, I absolutely love that coral. It has not really grown much. It encrusted onto the, I can see that it encrusted onto the frag plug. Uh, four locals started pulling out and growing on the rack. I forgot what this is called. And this one, Long Island, is not doing much for me. It just colored up a little bit. It was pretty, pretty pale when I first got here, but now it's coloring up. It got like a nice blue coming in, I see. Um, so the color started morphing. And I feel like they're a little bit more vibrant now which is great. I love vibrant color uh, SPS. I'm not a big fan of the pastel look. So these are hanging in there, but in terms of winning the Gorilla Contest, I do not have a candle in a hurricane's chance of winning that thing. However, the fact that they survive for almost half a year in my tank, just kind of haphazardly, it's a win in my book personally. Love these guys. You may notice a bird's nest right here. I'm just holding this for my Reef Sensei Jim Telegram. Um, and also, since we're looking at frack rack, we got these guys. These got stung by the mushroom, which we'll talk about later. Look at that guy. That guy is a surprise. It's a wow, wow import, and we can talk a little bit about it. But this got stung, and I firsthand got, got a taste to see how the bacteria secondary infection just comes in and take down corals. And with these, I use a antibiotic dip of Cipro and, and that kind of stopped it in its track. Now it's a matter of recovery. Oh, by the way, yes, that's a Bahama Lama's Whipping Willow. We'll talk about that shortly. Okay, last bit of SPS. I'll keep this really short. We have different types of Monty caps here. This is a standard uh, red or orange, whatever color you think it is. I cannot really tell. People, different people call it differently. We have the National Aquarium's Green Monty from Jim. We have the TSA, I think they call it the Death Spiral. It's a nice orange with like purple palette, which I thought was pretty unique. And finally, we got this one. This is my favorite cap in this tank. This came from Telegram Gem, who I believe got it from Alex. You can't really tell from that angle, but there's actually a red stripes. And what I like is exactly that. It's a splice with a uh, red Monty with this browns, neon browns one. And um, I believe Kevin from TSA did a podcast with uh, Reef Bomb, Keith, on 
splicing corals, these kind of stuff. And he mentioned that if I want to promote the, um, the mix or a certain color, you need to frag that portion out and try to grow it. So if you only get like all orange with no reds, the frag is not gonna grow any red, typically not. So that's why you saw one piece got fragged off here, a lot of red there. And so I frag one piece and return it back to uh, Jim. And I'm gonna wait for this part to grow up, I'll frag it again and try to promote more reds. But this is interesting. I can see why he is really into splicing corals now. It does add another dimension and challenge and a little surprise and a little pleasant, usually, hopefully, hopefully, pleasantly surprised with uh, different corals, whether they mix or not, and if they mix, which color dominates and how the mix of the swirl is gonna look like. So it's, it's kind of like a fun little frontier, a little specialized branch in terms of uh, growing these corals out. Okay, LPS next, where do I even start? Let's, let's start from the bottom and then we'll work our way up to the torches. Ganiporas, absolutely going gangbusters. The red ones, the pink ones, they just, they're like, hemisphere almost a sphere now and they're stinging everything they're stinging absolutely everything that one thankfully is still playing nice with the um anacopora i'm not sure how long they're gonna play nice for this one is absolutely torching all the zoas and mushrooms and the chalice right there i need to move that i simply do not have the heart to frag them ideally i'll chop off half take the bottom half and slice and make a lot of frags but number one i do not have a frag tank to keep it and number two it does look really cool so they're here to say back wall that's where i keep all my gunny poor frag i figure okay you know what it may be kind of cool to have like different streams of colors of gunny poor growing on the back wall kind of similar to the um green star polyps and the clove uh, rainbow clove i don't think a lot of people grow gunny poros on the back wall and they don't they're not too demanding in terms of lights uh, so I feel like at least they're happy. They've, they've grown since I moved them and I moved them there for a while. And I am mounting them using the Aqua Rock single uh, magnetic frag holder. They're pricey little guys, but they, they look pretty. If I were to do it again, I could potentially just kind of snip off the frag plug stem and just epoxy them onto the back wall. But again, I had no time, absolutely no time earlier this year. I just need to get it done and they're there to stay. And so far everything seems okay. I do, they do have magnets in there. Um, I do run ICP tests every three or four months to keep track of everything and nothing out of ordinary shows up. So we're good so far. I've had people reaching out asking, what is the secret to keeping Ganipora healthy and open like this? I think for me, the biggest game changer was when I started dosing trace elements, specifically I think is the manganese. All the stuff that I'm reading and from um, how much deficit I had in manganese uh, during my first ICP CP test before I started doing trace elements and the almost immediate response these gunny pores gave me after I started dosing, correcting the trace. Um, I, I do feel like manganese is probably the game changer, at least in, in my particular tank. Continuing the LPS chat, let's talk about the space infector pectinia. That is a surviving large piece of frag that I grew out in this tank for about two years at this point. That right there. It's a piece of Jim's. Uh, when he brought his big piece here, we had to chop it up because it started dying. And this is before I started doing antibiotic dips. So I, I chopped a couple pieces, gave them to um, Reef Nerd Aquatics Lynn, and I kept one piece here. And that small piece has completely recovered and has grown since. This is one of the smallest pieces, and it's growing well. And down here, from one of the die-offs that spawned this frag, so that's another piece that was looking really, really rough. The center piece with a little bit of tissue, I just kind of shove it all the way to the bottom. And thankfully, this recovered and this grew well. But the interesting thing is that look at the growth pattern, completely different. In terms of PAR readings, um, they're getting somewhat similar amounts of micromole, so not a huge difference, but I believe what the big difference is is the water currents. This one is blasted by, well, not blasted. My tank, the flow is not that strong uh, for SPS tank standard. It's not bad, but not that strong. So it has this kind of growth pattern versus at the bottom, there's almost no flow down there. It's like all the polyps. Once in a while, they get like a burst of uh, water currents, but not much. Look at how flat that is. So I find that interesting. In terms of color intensity, Space Invader Pectinia has always been really consistent regardless of what kind of light you have them under. That's why it's one of my favorites, uh, Pectinias. I know there are rainbow, all kinds of different Pectinias, but the coloration uh, and the growth pattern, I just absolutely love them. They look like Alcorn, right? Absolutely beautiful. But uh, yeah, so these are the three pieces of Space Invader Pectinius. Are we ready to talk about the torch corals? Are we, <laughs> are we ready to talk about the torch? 
So Torch, my goodness. Um, earlier this year, I discovered that I have Euphilia eating flatworm in this tank and that was, oh my goodness. That put me on high alert. I started dipping these corals every single week. Um, I started using the uh, Polyp Lab Pri Reprime, Reprimer, I think, because I got a couple bottles that uh, they gave me year years ago. Uh, <laughs> perks of being a, s a social media influencer, right? I hate that term. Call me content creator, please. Um, so I finally pulled it out. I dipped them. Absolutely works. All the flat warmth fell right off. But once I got done with those bottles, I realized that, man, this, this is going to be pricey. So I started looking at alternative, and that's when Lynn recommended uh, potassium chloride. Did I get that right? Let me check. Yes, potassium chloride. I bet I get this right. I use this all the time. Uh, I started buying bulk supplements from Amazon. This is way cheaper, and it does the same thing in this particular case. Flatworms go in. If there's any flatworm, they kind of falls off within 30 seconds. So it's really obvious, and it is really gentle on the corals. So I've been dipping these religiously for three months. That's my treatment plan. After three months, this is clean. I thought, we're done. Imagine my surprise three months later when I noticed something popped up here. Turns out it's not just the torch corals that got the Euphilia eating flatworms. Duh. Hammers and frogs, frog spawn also got it. I guess the flatworms did not get a memo that there has been a change in family names. The, these are no longer Euphilias. The uh, Flambygalia, I cannot pronounce that word, my apologies. But flatworms are living on this, this particular, uh, particular frog spawn. Nothing else, this particular one. So, Back to dipping uh, once a week, three months to break the uh, life cycle to make sure everything is good and clean. And I, I also dip the torch and I dip every single hammer and frog spawn. It was a task. So each week I actually dip two, 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 two sessions. First session is torch. And then the next day or day after I'll do all the um, frog spawn and hammer. It was not fun, but I got to know my corals really well. So that is excellent. I'm happy to report that since the first initial dipping and egg scraping to her eggs, that, that's what scares me the most. No other frags, flatworms has been found. Or maybe they were so small that as I dipped them, they just kind of fell off, I didn't even notice. So that is the good news. It has been a while, but I continue to dip just in case. Um, I think at some point I will be comfortable enough to start sharing these frags, whether it's trading, selling, or just giving them away, but not at the moment. And I do have a lot, a lot, a lot that I do get out of this tank. Uh, we have standard Indo Golds. We have the uh, New York Knicks. I started with one head. Now it's, oh my goodness, look at all these. Uh, we have the Holy Grail. And uh, in terms of hammer and frog spine, we have the classic green tips with uh, green, green tentacle, purple tips. ACI Royal Line, which is new release this year. I believe that's a King Hammer. And we have the Prince of Darkness. They have grown really well, I think. Uh, they're in the process of splitting. I know the Prince of Darkness already split, but the skin is still attached on the stem. They have a really long skin in my tank. So I'm not quite ready to frag them yet, but once the, the skeleton catches up a little bit, uh, where it makes sense to frag, uh, Telegram and Reef Sensei will get the first first dip on the uh, Prince of Darkness. The King Hammer may take a while. Though looking at it, it almost looked like it has three, maybe three and a half head now. Huh, interesting. Because when I dipped it this week, it was two heads. But it looks like it's definitely something is forming, which is cool. But yeah, bottom line is that um, Euphilias and Frimbagalia, I just call it Frog Spine and Hammer, they are growing well. And I have not been able to rehome any of these simply because I know that this tank had had, um, had a hope, you feel you're eating flatworm. I want to make sure that it's completely eliminated before I uh, move any of these corals out of this tank and risk investing out of hobbyists. That's the last thing I want. Oh yeah, I also got some cool kryptonite candy cane here too. All right, moving on to softies. Oh, almost forgot to mention and almost forgot. Way back here is another coral that Box Reef hooked me up with. That's actually a Walt Disney. It's supposed to be golden. I see some, actually, you know what? Now that I look at it, yeah, it's a little colors peeking in. There's something like pink polyp. Yeah, a little pop is coming back. 
But uh, it definitely thawed out in my tank, turned green, and now I'm just starting to see some color. One of the main reasons is probably the lower par value. Uh, over there is only about 200 micro mold. Uh, the top of this SPS rock where it's about 270. So it's a lot lower. Up here on the Zola rock, this area is only 170. Also 170, same bed is roughly 120. The par reading for this tank is pretty low uh, because after the crash, I immediately dialed back out of light because as I saw the uh, coral started getting stressed, I'm like, oh no, maybe it is the it is the light. It's too, in, well, not so much intense, but the coverage is so much more. And the spectrum is obviously different uh, because this is, this is the um, AI blade glow uh, versus the um, original aliexpress strip light and only have like i think it's like is it 4, 450 470 nanometer alternating this is more it has a broader range and also a better coverage so i think that stress certain corals out understandably so i immediately dialed the whole thing back but i never really dialed back up after the crisis has passed um so in the last i'll say maybe three or four months I started slowly bumping back up. So right now the power Y value is still really low and that's gonna play a factor when we start talking about the clam a little bit later on. But that's also one of the reasons why maybe some of these SPS is not displaying all this full potential in terms of coloration, especially the Walt Disney. But um, that could also be why some of these colors starting to come in again because I started bumping the, uh, uh, the light intensity up. Um, in terms of nutrients, this tank has always been pretty high nutrients. Uh, usually it sits about phosphate of 0.15-ish. I say ish because it fluctuates a little bit, usually on the higher end, not so much lower. So usually 0.15 and nitrate is usually 20, 25 or 30 around that range. Uh, so this is a high nutrient tank and with high nutrient tank with SPS, um, yeah, usually it's okay to bump the light intensity and flow up a little bit because they have that uh, nutrient to work with. But that is word, hey, look at that. Random ammo crap is popping out right there. Look, look at the ammo crap. Oh man, uh, do I have stories to tell you, um, especially when we start getting into clam. Why have so many ammo crab just running around eating bubble algae instead of relying on Vibrant like I did two years ago. That was a mistake. But anyways, we can get into that a little bit later. Um, yeah, where were we? We're going to talk about softies, right? Let's go talk about softies, man. We got some nice softies in this tank. I would like to start our softie journey by talking about the mushrooms. I have a lot of uh, beautiful discosoma mushroom. Well, it's not softy, anemones, but a lot of people feel that they're soft corals. So I'm just gonna <laughs> lump them together. Mushrooms, I have a lot of job breakers. That's kind of like the bread and butter for this tank. I started out with one rock. It just completely took over. That is the original job breaker. You see that almost half the, that's by the way, that's really big. It's about five or six inches across. Half of it is red. We got some green streaks starting to come in. Usually green is like little specks, but now it's streaking. So that is a old uh, mushroom anemone. And of course, the, uh, these are the offsprings. Back there are all the ones that uh, Tank Addicts, or Daniel, when he broke down his tank, he gave me chunks of jawbreakers, uh, simply because I gave him one a while back and it just did really well for him. I think I gave away more than half of the jawbreaker that he gave me simply because, you know, he gave it to me. I can't, I won't be selling them or anything like that. So I gave away half of it. The other ones are just kind of hanging out here. I do have two or three upstairs in the mangrove tank as well and they seem to be doing well in the mangrove tank so i may actually move some of the more mature ones up there because those those one in the mangrove tank are a little bit smaller i want to test out the water first and the light and the flow make sure it's okay before i move everything out over here i started collecting other types of mushrooms uh, namely the magic carpets i traded one of remy's bahama llama weeping willow frags for a um magic mushroom. It was supposed to be for a Keija Wada uh, frag, but uh, the local reefer lost it, unfortunately. But he was like, hey, do you want magic mushroom? I'm like, hell, are you serious? Because this is expensive. Uh, but he's like, yeah, man, it's growing up. It's growing well for me, let's let's trade. So he hooked me up with this really generous piece. The magic mushroom is just one of those OG Rebectus mushroom that I've always wanted um, because they have such a variety in terms of how they how they look, but I just could never afford it. Um, so I'm really happy to get my hands on one of these guys. And he also thrown in one of these uh, kryptonites uh, mushroom as well. Notice I got some maroon specks on there too. So that's kind of cool. So this guy, this is a WoW Imports um, that Reef Nerd Aquatics hooked me up with. This unfortunately 
got giant. I didn't realize it got this big uh, during the day because I was super busy. I never really had time to come down during the afternoon, but I never realized it got this big. So I had these guys. This used to be a lot bigger. It was growing so well. It was on that rock and it started touching it. And by the time I realized I pulled it away, it's already skeleton on one, one edge, just the edge, right? And I pulled it away. I didn't think too much of it. And then day by day, I, I guess I didn't notice it started dying back. Like it's beyond, way beyond uh, the stung part. So I guess the tissue was dying and then bacteria is kind of feeding on it. So uh, when I noticed it, it was almost a week later. I did a hydrogen peroxide dip on it, a diluted hydrogen peroxide dip, followed by some um, antibiotic dip. That's the, I'm using the KFC recipe. And that seems to stop the receding within one day, just one dip, one session. And I am not quite sure if it's recovering yet, but at least it did not die any further. So that's good. Same, same situation here, also on that rock. But I think it's the green mushroom that was uh, stinging this. So you see bare skeleton on this side, but this one is recovering really well. And this one came from my Reef Sensei gym. And since we're here, let's take a look at this um, Bahama Lama's Weeping Willow. This is Rami strands of Weeping Willow. It did get Jack Adams' blessing in terms of calling it the Weeping Willow. Although it is not the OG Weeping Willow because at least according to Remy, when the flow is off, the polyp does not really drape over the stock that much. However, this also depends on the tank situation as well. So I'm hoping that in my tank or some other people's tank, it's gonna develop even longer polyps so that it'll also drape over. But it is absolutely beautiful piece. The mother colony is over there. It's, uh, it's not the happiest in that location at the moment because it's being blasted by flow. I noticed that when the flow is a little bit shorter, the polyps get a little bit longer. But the good news is that this coral frags really easy, recovers really well, and the frag mounts so easily. Like within a week, it's already attaching to substrates or the, whatever mounting media you're using. Unlike some of the other ladder, like the neon green toadstool or the Fiji yellow, which that's a frag that's grown out really nicely. Those took forever to attach. Um, but yeah, this cuts well and also sticks well, but they grow really, really slow. And here's the other frag that I have. I'm trying it in the shade to see if it makes a difference. And that's why it's all the way in this corner right here. Now up here, this is the Japanese whipping willow that I got from Red Frog during our trip to Toronto. And when I got it from him, it's starting to recover. It was really short polyp because I believe he may have cut off the crown and then frag it up. But he wanted to give me a big piece. So he gave me the whole stock, which I really appreciate because look at this. How impressive does that look? Also, if you did not see that video, I traded him a um, Remy's uh, Bahama Lama Sweeping Willow. It's just so that we're all kind of collecting and swapping to <laughs> all the different willow variations. So this this is a look, this is a looker. It's absolutely going to be beautiful because the polyp gets longer every single week. And sticking to the Weeping Willow trend, this is another Weeping Willow that I got from Reef Nerd Aquatics, Lynn. Uh, this was sold to her as a Weeping Willow from, I believe, the Coral Nursery. But the polyp never got that long in her system. So she gave me a frag and I had this for about a year at this point. And the polyps are finally starting to get long. So we'll see what this turns into. Um, I do believe the OG uh, Weeping Willow have thinner needle-like polyp like this. This seems a little bit thicker. So we'll keep an eye out. Even if this does not turn out to be the uh, OG Weeping Willow, but I'm just a fan of those long polyp anyway, so it's all good. Now, speaking of Weeping Willow and Lin, she also gave me that piece. You probably can't see it. It's also a Japanese Weeping Willow. Um, it's an olive green, darker green. The, pot, the individual tentacle is a little bit thicker than the Japanese Weeping Willow we got from Red Frog. But uh, Nicholas, Aqua Splenda, suspect that that may be the same coral as this. Uh, we'll see. I'm planning to move that frag over here just so we can kind of compare and have them grow in the same uh, situation. Right now they look kind of different, especially the coloration, but the other one also does have kind of like a pink tip. So they may be the same. If so, I do not mind because they're absolutely beautiful. And knowing the potential of this one, because Rap Frog has some videos of this particular coral with long flowy noodle-like polyps, breathtaking, I can't wait. Along the same line of soft corals, let's also talk about these guys. I'm a big fan of weird soft corals and these two are it. This looks really similar to the uh, Kejuwada uh, Nymphius, but it is not. The Kejuwada Japanese Nymphius is a uh, pink. 
This is more white in coloration, but this is still photosynthetic so, as long as I can tell. I also got this from Lin. The one in the back also came from Lin. This is a really special coral. There's no official name for it, except for like Japanese Singularis or something like that. Um, yeah, unnamed, unnamed, but this coral connected me with Red of the coral reef shop in Toronto. Um, the story goes that I posted a picture of this on uh, Instagram. It's like, oh, this is so cool. Look at this cool soft corals. And Mark reached out. And Mark used to be part owner of the um, that coral shop, the coral reef shop in Toronto. And he mentioned that the current shop uh, caretaker, Red, has a couple colonies of it. And Mark also sent me a video of how his look as a full grown colony, dude. This thing looks absolutely amazing. Once it's grow out, this is gonna blow all these soft corals out of the water, for, at least from this tank. Maybe not this one, but this is gonna look absolutely amazing, at least according to the videos that he sent. During our conversation, Mark seeing that I'm going to Toronto, he suggests that I hit up Red and go check out the store, and I did, and that video is gonna come next. So huge thanks to Mark, huge thanks to Red for uh, kind of allowing us to check out your store on a day off, and also huge thanks to Lynn for hooking me up with this coral that connected all the dots. We have to talk about the rainbow cloves and the green star polyps and stuff. Oh, I didn't even talk about this guy, rainbow chalice. Uh, you know what? Let's save that for next time. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the clams, man. The rest of clams, Survivor, doing extremely, extremely well. And I now that I look at it, holy crap, it got big. It got big, it definitely got big. I love this guy, I absolutely love this guy. I was really nervous because I tried a couple clams a year and a half ago, two years, did not end well. A lot of them last maybe a couple days, a couple weeks, and then they just kind of perish. I was scratching my head until news broke that vibrant, vibrant, what I dosed to get rid of bubble algae. I did two dose. Uh, two two years ago to address the bubble algae. Turns out Vibrance is not a bacteria product as claim is a algicide. It's essentially algae fix, except quote unquote for reef tank. Side effects, they are deadly to mollusk. And that's what clams are. Hearing that, I was upset. I was angry. I was still a little skeptical simply because am I just blaming the products or was did I do something wrong that caused the death of all those clams? But ultimately, I cannot really put my fingers on anything else besides the fact that I, I was dosing Vibrance around that time uh, when I had those clam and yeah. But after all these times, seeing how the Duress clam is still alive and well, I figure, you know what, let's, let's give clams one more try. And over there, from Clamania, we have absolutely two beautiful Captive bread crocea clam. I have heard of captive bread maximus, terrisus, but not so much, or not so often croceas. And these are really, really colorful. Uh, according to John from Clamania, these are about 2.5 years old. These are the kind of latest batch of crocea uh, clams, and they are adjusted to current life. They have always been under roughly 300 micro mold in terms of um, light intensity or power, power reading. So that's why when I was placing these clams, he was stressing. He was like, dude, try your best to put them under high lights. 300 is kind of like targets while they'll, they'll, they'll tolerate lower ones, like up to maybe 250, but they do prefer higher lights. So that's why we try our best. And dude, those rocks, they're sitting on the Ecopora. They're sitting on those torts. I have no space there and turns out the clams like it enough. But you know what? This video, I look down at how long this recording already is. Let's save the clam talk for the next video. Well, not the next video. Next video, we're going to Canada, but the following video because there are a lot of new information I got that I want to share with you guys. And the acclimation process was a process and finding the right location also really important, especially for these Crocea clam who is super light loving. We'll chat a little bit more about those. And now that I have a little bit more time, I hope to be able to upload a little bit more frequently. So see you guys soon.